Okay, so uh, we work on various issues, not just alcohol, but I've chosen to talk about alcohol because it tends to evoke very strong reactions. And I want to talk about the complexity of it, not just the good, not just the bad, not just the ugly, all of it. Alcohol is quite interesting. So what reactions does alcohol evoke? It might depend on your age, your experiences, which part of the world you come from. So it can be very interesting. For example, you might think of alcohol as something for friends, right? Something which evokes good fond memories of drinking with your friends, making memories which last your lifetime. They can even evoke something, maybe some things which arouse your passion, maybe something of depression, right? You drink, you're depressed, you're down in life. It could be very complex. Alcohol could give you feelings of having very altered feelings, very altered experiences when you're drunk. It could also evoke loneliness. Alcohol can evoke solitude, it can evoke going down just a completely lonely track, or it could also evoke euphoria. You're just celebrating, you're partying all night, right? Alcohol is very complex. But the truth is, why, why, why is it so, right? That means it's not just simple, it's not just giving you one experience, right? It depends on who you are. What really alcohol evokes, what I've tried to show through these paintings is, on left you'll see basically, if it's just a drink, it could be pleasant. If it is too much, it could be sorrowful, it could be problematic. Same applies uh, for, let us say you just had a drink, you had good experience versus you're drinking all the time, it's heavy amount, somebody is drunk driving, they end up having a lot of people dead. So it's about the dose, it's about frequency. It's also about the context, right? A pregnant woman drinking could alter a child's health. On the other hand, a healthy woman drinking uh, who's not pregnant could be improving her chances of not getting diabetes or osteoporosis or reducing chances of her getting dementia if it is, let's just say, one drink, let's say, an alternate day. So it all depends on the context. It's not simple. So alcohol is complicated. And it's not just a social problem. It's an interesting biological problem. It's a very interesting problem for individual families also. It's a problem for government policy making. So what is needed to try to understand alcohol is data science, it's neuroscience, it's social science. It's also awareness through media. Um, I'm not that capable of doing all of it. I'll just try to talk to you about a little bit of the things that we do with alcohol and try to present the overall picture. I'll actually try to even summarize it through one of the last paintings, which is the same individual with one facet where the person is enjoying alcohol um, in mild amounts and is a happy individual. On the other side is a sad individual once the person cannot live without alcohol at all. So the transition for even the same individual can happen over lifetime. Let us talk a little bit about history and let me even speculate, but I'll, as a scientist, it's my responsibility to tell you when I'm speculating, when it's not fact, it's just my hypothesis. So I'll tell you a little bit about evolution. So in fact, most organisms make a little bit of alcohol. It's a result of your anaerobic uh, respiration. Microorganisms such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast make it a lot. We utilize them to actually make alcoholic drinks. It's part of their respiration in anaerobic environment. In fact, a lot of organisms even consume alcohol. You can find drunk butterflies. There are insects such as fruit flies where maggots would be consuming alcohol to keep themselves free of germs. In fact, if a male fruit fly gets rejected by a female in mating, that male fruit fly is more likely to consume alcohol because alcohol gives that fruit fly a rewarding feeling. It's not that bad kind of a feeling. So that guy would go and get drunk. And the source of alcohol is readily available in the rotting fruits that fruit flies grow on. Now you'll say, okay, we are talking of insects. We are not talking of uh, something close. There are birds which get drunk eating rotten cranberries. How about mammals? The bunch of mammals which get drunk in natural environment. Had there not been humans making alcohol, the bunch of mammals which get drunk. A lot of monkeys get drunk. There are, like famous example is a pen-tailed shrew which gets drunk. There are also myths. The myths of elephants getting drunk 
on some you know, rotten fruits. Actually, people have shown that the amount of fruit it will take, they do not consume in a day. So they are also myths. But historically even, a lot of mammals have been used by humans that they'll give a lot of alcohol, so they lose inhibition. So, for example, when elephants were used in war, they were given a lot of drinks, so they'll be a bit agitated, more willing to attack the enemy, go along in a fight. So alcohol has interesting effects on mammals, including us, we are mammals. So alcohol is part of an interesting history of consumption. Now we do not know whether our predecessors, in terms of direct line in evolution, how much alcohol were they consuming, how often were they consuming, was it part of food or not. So we do not necessarily, I'm not going to say, even what makes us homo sapiens is not even 100% homo sapiens. All of us who have had significant life as human species out of Africa have a bit of Neanderthalic component, between 2 to 6%. We do not know how much alcohol Neanderthals consumed. People in East of Asia had, you know, other human components. So we know of two, three other human lines that have contributed to making modern Homo sapiens. So we do not know a lot about them. So we do not know too much about prehistory, but we know at least 10,000 years ago, you go to Stone Age period in China, you have evidence of wine making, rice wine, rice beer, whatever you want to call it. You have evidence. In Babylonium, you have evidence in Egypt, you have evidence in Georgia, you have one of the most ancient wine. When you think of wine, you'll think France. Well, actually, you have the oldest evidence in Georgia and Azerbaijan, not in France. So, this has been part of our drink. Now, there is evidence of meat, or madhu, as you'll call it, uh, in Indo-Iranian people for quite a long time. So, alcohol goes back quite, a uh, quite old in our history, at least 10,000 years old. Uh, there are a lot of uh, historians which claim, and there's enough evidence for it, that bread came a bit later. We were using grains to make alcohol before. There is a difference now. Now, don't go just drinking that we have been drinking alcohol since ages, so here's my excuse. Let me go and party with alcohol. The difference is most of the historical alcohol was not this high in alcohol percentage. Also, it wasn't refined distilled alcohol. There is an important difference. Once you're distilling, you're throwing out all the vitamins that the yeast made, all the proteins, all the minerals. So alcohol for a large part of human history, whenever it was consumed, it was serving two important purposes. One, water wasn't always um, good water, a lot of chances of infection. Secondly, it was providing a lot of nutrients. I'm not professing prohibition, I'm not professing alcoholism, I'm, I'm just putting facts in front of you that when alcohol has been there historically, in fact, a lot of interesting alcohol from countries of South Asia, let's broadly consider Indian subcontinent, how many, we all would go out and have beer, maybe we'll have distilled alcohol like whiskey. How many of us would have mahua? How many of us would have tari? Historical alcohols of countries have been largely forgotten with a very sort of monolithic, um, advance of few kinds of alcohols from West, which have come recently, but actually all the cultures, and we are not talking of just, let's say, South Asia, because I'm from this part of the world, or let's say North America or Europe. Actually, you can look at Mesoamerica. So alcohol has been a part of human history everywhere. Now, let me even make some speculation, and I want to be very clear, it is speculation. Uh, it's not a fact. I think alcohol is a neurotransmitter in brain at least an interesting neuromodulator. Bear with me why I'm saying that. It's expressed in only alcohol-related enzymes, like alcohol dehydrogenase, are expressed in brain. They're expressed in liver also, where alcohol breakdown happens. They are not expressed uniformly. They're expressed in specific parts of brain, especially ones which are involved in learning and memory. So it's just my pet hypothesis. I'm just speculating. And the reason, it's not very far-fetched hypothesis. Somebody, if I had said this idea about nitric oxide 20 years ago, somebody might have told that I'm crazy. Well, we now know it's a neurotransmitter. A gas is a neurotransmitter. In fact, that's how Viagra works, retrotransmission. So uh, that's how people can actually even have heart attacks. You get too much nitric oxide. So there are various things which are acting in brain. So it is possible that alcohol has far more interesting history. One can even counter my hypothesis. People who are neuroscientists in audience might say maybe there is anaerobic metabolism in brain, maybe more so in some part of the brain. I would argue that the parts which have higher activity, such as brain stem, do not have much of it. In fact, which are more responsible for uh, learn, learning and memory have, uh, have more of it. 
So that kind of bolsters my case, but that's just an interesting hypothesis what alcohol could be doing, and that's my speculation. Now, let's get to the good of alcohol. What good is uh, alcohol for? Well, number one, it served as diet for ages, for millennia, it served as diet. It can be good food. It also promotes friendship in small amounts. You, a lot of you who are computer programmers would have heard of Balmer's curve. You get better programming with just one drink. Now that should not be used as an evidence to, you know, just guzzle up alcohol, be drunk and not be able to do anything. So alcohol makes memories. In fact, Greeks could not think of having symposium. That word sort of came from the notion that you need to have alcohol together. So friends would sit together with some alcohol and that's how uh, even bonds would be made, that's how issues would be discussed. In fact, most ancient cultures had alcohol related gods. It's not just Dionysius. We had gods in South Asia which, and which had alcohol at least related component. Alcohol has been part of even Judeo-Christian traditions. Then later on there have been certain monolithic uh, uh, religions which have banned alcohol also because most religions recognize that too much of it is problematic. So alcohol has a lot of good component. It has bad component. One of the obvious one is you can't perform things that you're doing, you're hungover. That becomes problematic. But that is just one day bad. Hungover also has a lot of uh, issues, a lot of myths, especially in college students. People would say, you mix two different drinks and you get more hungover or this and that. You hungover because of alcohol breakdown and dehydration. So it's not about different drinks and other myths unless the drink is really bad. It has other secondary metabolites. But the real issue is with the ugly of alcohol. The ugly of alcohol can be really ugly. Number one, let us say uh, it leaves you powerless. Somebody faints out. Domestic violence issues, social issues, economic issues. So there is a lot of ugly of alcohol. You don't have to look, maybe not just in your lives, if it becomes difficult to be objective. Look at lives of celebrities, right? You can look at Hollywood, you can look at Bollywood. So alcohol has a lot of ugly dimension from that end. But it has ugly dimension from health end also. So if you consume too much alcohol, you have liver related problems. You can have cardiac problems. You'll have more desires, but you'll function less well. It leads to sexual dysfunction. Chronic alcoholism is one of the most leading causes of sexual dysfunction. On the other hand, small amount of alcohol can do wonders for health, for people who are in the healthy category. So alcohol is really complicated. Now, alcohol leads to addiction, right? How does alcohol lead to addiction? That might be an interesting question. Because it activates the same reward pathways. Alcohol makes us happy and it makes us rewarded. There is another dimension of it. When you give body constant alcohol, um, what it results in is that the system becomes hyper excitable. There is a reason because alcohol in large amounts makes you sleepy, it's a sedative. Your body and your brain is compensating. So you are now, if you are chronically alcoholic, your system becomes hyperactive to compensate for it. Well, that's a problem. People can even have epileptic seizures. But there is solution. There are medicines and there is rehabilitation. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we sort of are doing and what we are realizing in the context of developing countries, especially India. So we started uh, asking questions on ground. We started conducting surveys. People in India are not willing to even admit if alcoholism is a problem. Other thing we realize, it's not black and white. There's a difference between cities and villages. There's a difference between east and west. Surprisingly, people who come from different tribal backgrounds, like Santhals, they're more open to admitting their problems of alcohol and actually visiting a doctor. But when we ask people, are you willing to go to a doctor for alcohol-related problem? Their response was primarily, we'll deal with the religious leader or we'll treat within the family. So people's openness, willingness to deal with alcoholism is not there. But then there are other issues. So the, how do you address it? If government data is not enough, we basically go on to Twitter, Facebook. You do simple data science, find out what people are talking about, in al about alcohol. You basically do web scraping of what is there in media. You find interesting patterns. But end of the day, you have to diagnose a problem, but you also have to come up with medicines. So how do you make medicines? I told you a very simple thing about how the system becomes hyper excitable. There are various medicines on alcohol. I'll tell you this one simple thing. Now, if the system is becoming hyper excitable, think 
you can make animals also drunk. Fruit fly, which I talked about. Give it alcohol, now you take alcohol away. Is the animal behaving like an epileptic animal? You can do it with another animal, let's say a worm, C. elegans. You can even do it with cell lines, you can do it with mice. Why would you do it with multiple animals? You may ask this question. Reason is simple. If a thing would work in multiple organisms, it is more likely to be conserved, and whatever medicines you find are more likely going to work in humans. In fact, there's a daunting cost of drug. An average cost of a neurobiological drug, of a brain-related drug that comes to market is around $13 billion. So if you can reduce that $13 billion price tag down to less than a billion, you've done a lot. And it's primarily that price tag is because preclinical result fails at clinical level. We are doing another thing also. In addition to using multiple organisms for drug training, we are using AI. So I come from two training, one as a neurophysiologist, other as a soft computation person with mathematics background. So I tend to use multiple parameters in screening. I'll not take you through this technical aspects of it, but I'm telling you medicine is possible. Medicine is not the only way. If you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, what I would urge you to get involved in is even rehabilitation, because alcohol involves not just giving some medicines which makes you better, right? You can treat alcohol with medicines, but you need to do rehabilitation. Rehabilitation has been through rehab clinics or through Alcoholics Anonymous. They work differently for different people. For whom it works, they should definitely go for them. But can we make it better? Absolutely yes. We can make these things a lot better if scientists and engineers get involved. And that is, I think, one of the need of the R, not just to stay in lab, but to get out and recognize what the needs are. One interesting aspect I would like to talk about is regulation, uh, prohibition, and what are the policies. In India, we have four or five states which are dry, where alcohol is banned. US had alcohol banned entirely in 20s. Zia's era in Pakistan saw alcohol banned. Wherever alcohol has been completely banned, people have been involved in illegal alcohol trade. More people have died of alcohol. In fact, Al Capone promoted prohibition. One of the US biggest um, criminals proport, uh, promoted that. Now you'll say that's the US case, India is different. Where do you think Bombay's underworld got its money? Later on they did Bombay Blast, they shook nation's uh, backbone in a way by doing all these nasty things. But this money from Kareem Lala and all, in 50s and 60s, the gangsters actually in Bombay underworld primarily made money through alcohol prohibition. They were bootleggers. Prohibition also results in trading of alcohol which is not safe, which is actually methanol contaminated alcohol. And it's not intentionally contaminated, it is just that if it's not made properly, too much heat, methanol comes in which results in alcohol poisoning. So I'm not saying just don't do with prohibition, ban prohibition and let's all have drinks. What I'm saying is you need data-driven policy. Some places ban alcohol on a lot of days, some places just raise the taxes. It has to be data-driven. So in summary, my message is we all, scientists, engineers, need to get involved in policy making, in lab, in developing medicine, and let data guide your way in complex issues like alcoholism. Thank you.